Good morning and welcome to Wildwood Christian Church. I'm really glad that you're here, whether you're in the room with us right now or you're watching online, you're welcome to be with us. We've got a great service planned for you of singing and of, you know, just fellowshipping together and hearing God's word preached, meeting around the table. I would like to ask you if you would please to stand with me though and let's begin our service with a reading from Psalm 29. The psalmist says, ascribe to the Lord all you creatures of the earth. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Let's pray. Lord, we need you to reign over the flood of our lives, the overwhelming challenges, the problems we face. We come to you today to worship and to entrust ourselves to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, family. Just like Mark said, we're excited to worship together this morning. Wherever you are, we invite you to enter into the presence of God. More importantly, God is already here, and we're aware of what he's doing. So we've seen songs like this in response. Why don't you sing with us? Oh, 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 here we go. It wasn't for nothing that you shed your blood. So I'm gonna live like my shame is gone Even today I won't be shackled to the way I was I'm gonna live like my chains are gone The power of the blood, amen. 
dead and gone. Can we give him some praise? Amen. Well, we have a new song to sing this morning. It's not quite Easter yet, but we can always celebrate Jesus being alive, being here in this place. So I invite you to sing it as you learn it. It goes like this. See the tomb where he lay. See the stone rolled away. He is risen. He is risen. He's alive. We see his hands and see his feet, touch his scars and believe he is risen, he is risen, he's alive, always oh, alive and well today. Yes, he's alive. It goes like this that he lives all on earth. So hear the shackles breaking free, hear the song of the redeemed. He is moving, he is moving, he's alive right now, yes. So take this freedom, take this love, can you feel it rising up? He is here, he is here, he's alive. goes like this. Then you took all our shame. You left it in the grave. So we're forgiven. Yes, we're forgiven. The work forever done. Only by the blood. It is finished in our lives. It is finished. Can you see that? That you took alive this morning. Can we give him some praise together? Yes, he is. Amen. He's worthy. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are the risen Lord. Thank you that you came to die to take our sins away from us, but that you didn't stay dead, God. May we live in thankfulness every single day and remember that 
Without your blood, we cannot be saved and we cannot be who we are today. In your name, amen.
place. Thank you guys for singing with us. You're welcome to take a seat. close to God this morning. As you sat down, he sat down with you. If you wish, close your eyes, fold your hands. Let's go to him in prayer right now. Lord, we, we knew what to expect when we came in this room. We knew that there would be light and darkness, silence and noise, singing, praise, music. We rarely know truly what to expect when we, when we meet with you. We have so many requests, Lord, so many things going on. We, throughout our week, are constantly asking you to come into our lives, to come from your place on high and enter into the situations that we deal with day after day. We ask you to walk with our children as they travel the halls of education, of schools. Protect them from those who would do them harm, mind, body, spirit. We ask for you to come into our world where governments rage, bombs and bullets fall. We ask for you to silence the sounds of war and replace hatred with love, confusion with understanding, corruption with justice. Father, we ask you to come into our world of relationships where our marriages are in the middle of strife, where the angry words fly, the accusations and the sins. Separating us one from another, Lord, separating the generations, separating those who once previously said, I love you, but now all we can hear is hatred, frustration, hurt. We ask that you would enter into this world, Lord, in our finances. Help us to understand how to respond to high interest rates and inflation. How to save as well as spend. How to pay off the debt and be free from the bondage of, of interest. There's nothing about our life, Lord, nothing that we don't want you to be part of. We ask you to help to heal our hurts and our bodies. Let the diagnoses be wrong, the medicines be effective, the miracles happen. We bring to you our entire life today, Lord, those things I've mentioned and so much more. In generalities, you see us in, spe in specifics. And I ask that each person that can hear my voice that is praying this prayer would experience the miracle of you coming into their lives that we could be humble enough to confess our sin, to repent, to do something different, to go the opposite way, to find that your ways are always the right ways and your paths are always straight and level. Lord, help us to understand how day after day we can surrender ourselves to you for you are God and, and we are not. Protect us from the evil one and all of his schemes. But Lord, also, we pray today that not only would you come to us upon this earth, but that you would elevate us into heaven itself. That we may echo the words of Isaiah when he says, I see the Lord's throne high and lifted up. May we grasp what it would look like to see the angels encircling your throne, pronouncing unendingly, holy, holy, holy. For you are the Lord God Almighty. Lift us, Lord, from the bonds of this earth. Lift us just enough that we may peer over the gate, see the light of your love, to recognize that that is our destiny in Christ, our hope. Let us just stretch with all that we are to reach just even a bit closer to you and see that your hand is outstretched to us. And while it may not be Today that you'll call us home, someday you will. And someday you will see the righteousness of Christ splattered all over the sin of our lives. And you'll welcome us home, each a prodigal, returning home. The 
the celebration will be magnificent. The grace will flow, the mercy that you've already given us, the patience that you have allowed us. Help us to glimpse, to feel, to know that when we leave this place that we have been in the presence of the Most High God. May be your spirit that we follow, this your spirit we listen to, and may this spirit be the one that translates our stumbling words, our painful hearts, our confused confusion. Help us to walk in your ways, Lord, and carry us in this spirit during this worship. For we pray this in Jesus' name. We're so happy you're here this morning. Did you know that there was a holiday this week? Did you remember Valentine's Day? I almost forgot. I think it maybe was a little bit too warm. But I hope somebody made you feel special this week. But I always have a little trepidation when it comes to Valentine's Day because our world focuses so much on romantic love. So much maybe on the things that God didn't intend than what he did. Do we really understand what love is or what the creator intended when he gave us love? I don't think I really began to understand what love was until I became a mom. I have three boys and actually my middle son turned 18 this week. So it was a really special week for us. But I was thinking back to when he was born, he kind of made a very dramatic entrance as sometimes babies do. And I was concerned that I was going to lose him or that I would lose my own life in giving birth to him. And I remember in that moment that there was nothing I wouldn't do to make sure that he was safe or that he was okay or that he he had well-being in his life. There was nothing I wouldn't give, even my own life. And to think, that's how I feel about my child, and still do. Right, moms? Right, grandmas? Yeah. But to think that God's love is deeper still. So deep, I can't even grasp it. And so I think we can learn something about God's love from this passage, John 15, 12 through 17. Jesus says, this is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I have loved you. There is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends. Since I have told you everything the Father told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my command. Love each other. Jesus chose, he chose to die on the cross because of his great love for us. He chose to be the sacrifice for our sins. And that's one thing that I learned from this passage is that love means sacrifice. And sacrifice means love. God thought you were worth dying for. He wanted to secure your safety for eternity. He wanted to provide for your well-being in this life. He wanted to draw you into his family and to have a relationship with you closer than a son or daughter. So that is why we gratefully honor him each week at communion. When we're taking the juice and the cracker, we're remembering his sacrifice, his suffering, what he gave. But more than that, we're remembering that love that he has for us. In this passage, we also see that God's love compels us. His love compelled him to die, but our love, our love for him compels us to love others, to love others in a sacrificial way. He chose us for that very purpose. So during this time of communion, 
Maybe you just need to receive that love today. God loved me this much. He loves me this much. Or maybe you need to consider, how can I sacrifice to show my love to him, to love others in his name? Let's pray. You love us so deeply, Father, and it's hard for us to even grasp that. You weren't just willing to die for us. You died for us in our sin, in our brokenness. You went to the cross for me. You went to the cross for each of us. We were on your mind. We can't thank you enough. Words are not enough. Songs are not enough. But we will try. We will try to worship you with all that we have. Each and every day, you deserve our praise and our honor. You deserve all the glory for the way that you have expressed your love through Jesus, through his death and through his resurrection. We remember that too, Father. We remember that you brought him back and gave us hope for all eternity. Father, I pray over anyone that's listening right now that doesn't feel worthy of your love, remind them of how dear they are to you, how precious, and how much you want to be in a relationship with them today and each day. Thank you, Lord. We are so very grateful for Jesus. We pray in his name, amen. My husband, Eldon, grew up um, kind of in a, a, out in the country in a, a really small town, Dayton, Missouri, which is south of Kansas City. And he grew up going to a, a small country church. Um, this is a church I've visited many times because Eldon's dad still goes there. And one thing I love about visiting that 
Little Country Church is that the kids start the Sunday morning together with the adults. And then at some point, the pastor brings out this really large jar and sets it down in front of the altar. And all the kids get up and come and they put their offering in the jar, the tinkling of little, you know, coins and dollar bills, and they are so excited to do it. You know, they run up there and put it in and run back. And I always love that moment. And there's actually a couple of kids in first service each week that come with their their parents or their grandparents, and as they leave, they go to the little boxes in the back, and they have that same joy in putting their coins or their dollar bills in that box. And it always makes me smile to see how they do that. You know, God looks beyond what we give or how much we give to what our motivation is behind giving. If we're joyful in the task of giving, when did giving become hard? Should we have that joy? And one of the things that motivates me in giving here at Wildwood is that I get to see all the ways God is moving all the things that God is doing, all the ways that he meets physical and spiritual and relational needs around here. I mean, just this weekend, we had this amazing seminar and got to learn from the Bible together and talk about hard topics, and that was such a blessing. And I see that happening throughout the week, and it's really a joy to get to be a part of seeing those things happen each week. So however you give, whether you give online, whether you give on the app, whether you give through the boxes or mail, whether you give just a little bit or more, God sees your heart in that and the joy it brings him. Let's pray. Father, this offering is an offering from our heart to to yours. Yes, it's money, but it's so much more than that. It's It's an opportunity to be part of spreading the gospel message, of glorifying you, of spreading your message of Jesus in this community and even around the world. Thank you for that opportunity. Help us to remember that we cannot outgive you. You give us so much. You bless us so much. You don't really need what we have to offer, but you ask us to give, to trust you to participate in this way. So I ask your blessing upon everyone here and everyone who's giving. And we pray that you'll use it for your glory. Amen. Well, we just had a great Wildwood Academy seminar here this weekend on Friday and Saturday. And we got another one coming up in April. Hope you're able to attend. Had about 60 people involved. And our speaker we brought in from Johnson City, Tennessee, Dr. Jack Holland, is a professor there, but he's also the director of the Doctor of Ministry program at Emanuel Christian Seminary, which is part of Milligan University. And uh, I've known Jack a little bit for a number of years, but our pastor, Ron, uh, worked very closely with Dr. Holland to finish his doctor ministry degree that we celebrated here not too many months ago. And so we really thank you for getting Ron through that. And uh, it's been a blessing to us and to this church. So he's going to be talking about uh, John chapter 9 this morning. And would you welcome to this pulpit Dr. Jack Holland? Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Mark. If you haven't read Dr. Weimer's uh, project, it's really good. He did a great job. We gave him an A. (laughs) It's been wonderful to be with you. It's been a a wonderful weekend for me. Um, If I come back, I'd appreciate somebody turning the heat up outside. But other than that, it's it's been just a wonderful time. I'm going to read this morning from John chapter 9. I hope you'll bear with me. This is kind of a long text, but I think we need the entire story to be able to talk about what's happening. So reading from John, Gospel of John, chapter 9. As he walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, 
who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it's someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they asked him, they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus, made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been born blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud that had opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put mud on my eyes, then I washed, now I see. Some of, the Pharisees, some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they again said to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been born blind that he'd been blind and received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son. We know that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that he now sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I know that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have already told you and you would not listen. What do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to come, become his disciples? Then they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. The man answered, he is a, here's an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worship him, worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you are trying to teach us, and they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe him. Believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this and said to him, 
Surely we are not blind. Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have, you would not have sin. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. Thank you for letting me read that entire story. Because I think there's some important things that, that, that become apparent when you have the entire text. It reminds me that, that several years ago, actually more than that, uh, back when I was a youth minister, I had been invited by a friend who was a youth minister at another church. Uh, he invited me to come and speak to their youth group at a lock-in that they were having on a Friday and Saturday night. So I was supposed to speak on Friday and then on Saturday morning. I'd had my own lock-ins, and I knew that if sleep was going to happen, it would not be in the church. And so I unlocked myself and uh, went to a friend's house. When I came back the next morning, I talked to my youth minister friend and just asked him if everything had gone okay. He said, well, everything was fine. We did have one little issue. Uh, he had decided to try to slip away and get some sleep, and so he went and lay down in his office and uh, his office was close to the sanctuary. And as he was laying there, he thought he could hear music and decided he'd probably better go check out what's happening because all the teenagers were supposed to be at the other end of the building. And uh, as he came out into the foyer, he could see that there was a light on over the baptistry. And so he opened the door to the sanctuary and he could hear Beach Boys music. And when he came up and looked in the baptistry, two of his high school senior boys were having a pool party. Uh, they had, and it was, it was a premeditated pool party uh, because they had uh, inner tubes with Donald Duck face on them. Uh, they brought flippers, snorkels. Uh, they had the glasses with little umbrellas in them. I mean, it was, it was a full pool party with the Beach Boys playing. At some level, those two guys understood this, there's water and there's water. There's a baptistry and there's a place where they put water. And that, those, that there's something different there. I think they recognize that. I thought my friend was very creative in his response. Uh, he said, well, I'm going to give you guys a choice. Uh, I could share with your parents about what you were doing, or if you'd rather that they not know, it can be our secret, uh, but you'll come and meet with me uh, for the next four weeks on Wednesday after school, and we'll study the theology of baptism together. Uh, and then he said, and you'll also volunteer, uh, the next time the janitor needs to clean the baptistry, you can volunteer to help him. So I thought that was a pretty creative way to deal with it. But I tell that story because I think that, uh, like I said, there's some significance in the fact that they were swimming in the baptistry. That's something to import, important to this text. One of the keys to understanding the entire Gospel of John is that there's often a double meaning in Jesus' words where a seemingly common earthly thing is somehow given spiritual significance you remember in John chapter 3 how Nicodemus is confused by Jesus' statement that we must be born again. Nicodemus asks, how can, how can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? For Jesus, there's physical birth and there's birth from above. And then in chapter 4, Jesus meets the woman at the well. He tells her that she will drink from living water. There's water and there's water. Later in the gospel, Jesus refers to himself as the bread of life, as the good shepherd, as the vine, as the gate. On and on through John, there's this double meaning where words mean more than just their literal connotation. And in this text today, there's blindness and there's blindness. We just experienced it in the meal that we had together. There's bread in a little plastic cup, and there's bread. There's a cup, and there's a cup. Uh, 
and, and those things mean something more to us. And so in this text, there's blindness and there's blindness, there's darkness and there's light. The story actually tells a rather intriguing event. This man who had been blind since birth is healed by Jesus. The account of the miracle actually takes two verses in the long passage that I read. If the story ended there, it'd still be a wonderful miracle. But once again, Jesus has revealed himself as a figure who he's come to the world to make it a different place. And so there's a great deal more to the story because the focus turns to the various reactions that have happened because of the miracle. And by the time the, the story gets to verse 7, the blind, the blind man is healed, and then 34 more verses follow. Verses of debate and question back and forth. It all actually begins with a question from the disciples as they pass by and somehow know that the man was blind from birth. And so they wondered who sinned that he was born blind, and they then proposed two possible culprits. It was either the man himself and who was blind because he had sinned, in which case I guess the consequences for sin are somehow retroactive so that if you sin after you're born, you can be punished for it at your birth. The other possible guilty party would be the parents, um, and the people in the conversation seem to suggest that maybe the parents did something and so the man is now suffering for their error. But Jesus gives a different explanation. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed. I think it's a temptation in our modern reading of the text to get stuck right there, wondering what that means. Did God cause the man to be born blind so that Jesus could show off, so that Jesus could to perform a miracle? Does God use terrible things so that people will somehow see that God works in incredible ways? And if that's true, then what about all the times when it doesn't seem like God shows up? There's still a lot of blind people in this world. There's a lot of suffering. If God wants chances to be revealed, there are plenty of opportunities. But getting stuck in debate and focusing on the why and the can't and the won't and the back and forth, up and down conversations that seem to categorize this text to win the argument are at the heart of what this passage seems to be all about. The arguments get started when the, even the neighbors can't agree on whether or not the man they now see is actually the man that was blind. Some say, sure, it's him, and others say, no, it's someone who looks like him. And while the two groups are arguing, the man's walking around in the midst of them saying, I am the man. The skeptical keep asking him, if you were blind but now have your sight, how did you get it? And he tells them, Jesus put mud on his eyes, told him to wash it off, and when he did, he could see. But they don't buy that explanation. So they take him to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees don't seem concerned at all about the question of blindness. They want to know who Jesus thinks he is doing work on their Sabbath. But if that, this man was truly blind and Jesus healed him, then Jesus must be from God. But Jesus can't be from God or he wouldn't do miracles and he wouldn't mow the lawn on Sabbath. But did he open the, man, the blind man's eyes so that, so did, they op, did he open the blind man's eyes so let's see what the blind man says. And they go to the blind man, and he says, Jesus is a prophet. So even with the evidence literally staring them in the face, the Pharisees conclude that this man must not know what he's talking about. Let's see what his parents say. And even though Jesus doesn't blame the parents for the man's blindness, I don't think they come away from this story looking too great. Uh, you might think that, that parents of a son who had been born blind would be preparing a celebration, having a party. 
celebrating the fact that their son had been given this incredible gift. Instead, uh, he said, they say, he's our son. He was born blind. He can see now. Ask him. He's of age. We'd rather not get involved, is what they meant. And since the parents weren't any help, the Pharisees bring the healed man back in and want him to announce that Jesus is a sinner. To which the man replies, I don't know if he's a sinner or not, but I do know one thing. I was blind and now I see. And they want to know, well, how did Jesus did it? But the man who's not moved by their attempts to intimidate, and this is fascinating to me, he turns the tables and suggests that with all of their interest in Jesus, maybe they would like to be his disciples. So the, so the Pharisees pull out their big gun. We've got Moses on our side. And we know that Moses was from God, but we don't know anything about where this Jesus is from. And the man responds that if Jesus were not from God, he could do nothing. And finally, the Pharisees react. They take it all the way back to the man's birth after all. Born blind or not, who knows? But you were born a sinner. And they say, so who do you think you are? And they drove him out of the synagogue. In context, all of that back and forth and back and forth, it, it reminds me of one of those movies where the, the character that seems at the very beginning to be the weakest is actually the strongest. And the storied version of who the bad guy might be, at least in the eyes of the characters, keep changing. Uh, the debate, though, isn't about good and bad. It's about blind and not blind. And by the end of the story, the person that we thought was blind was one of the only people that could see. And the people who claim to see are actually the blind. There's blind and there's blind. The whole debate reminds me of this very odd reading that I'll share with you. It's, it's a kind of a frustrating spiral of doublespeak that was written by a psychologist made, named R.D. Lang, and he was attempting to portray the world of schizophrenia. And so Lang wrote, there's something I don't know that I'm supposed to know. I don't know what it is I don't know, and yet I'm supposed to know, and I feel I look stupid if I seem both not to know it and not know what it is I don't know. Therefore, I pretend I know it. This is nerve-wracking since I don't know what I must pretend to know. Therefore, I pretend to know everything. If we could see inside the argument of the Pharisees in this story, I think that at some level they're singing that same kind of song. We know we're not blind because we're supposed to be the ones that see, but we don't see what it is that we don't see. We see that you see that we are blind, but if you see that, then that means we don't see, and we cannot see that we don't see. And Lang ends his prose by finally making a little bit of sense. You may know what I don't know, but not that I don't know it. And I can't tell you, so you'll have to tell me everything. The blind man in John knew that he could not see. But unlike the Pharisees, he came to see Jesus. And Jesus gave him sight. The Pharisees claimed to see, but in their blindness... They appear confused, and they resort to intimidation, authoritarianism. In contrast, for all of his life, the blind, man, the blind man has had nothing in comparison to be confident about. He knows he was blind. He knows that he'd been a beggar, and when he's touched by Jesus, he comes to the, into this amazing assurance of faith and even outspoken witness as he faces the coercion and threats of those who doubt. I think part of the message of this story is in that contradiction, that on one hand, the man born blind, he doesn't even ask to have his sight restored, but because he was aware of his blindness, Jesus made him see. Those who refuse to know they're blind seem only to move further into darkness. So is the man born blind because he would eventually sin? Jesus doesn't think so. 
Jesus doesn't blame the parents. He was blind so that God's works might be revealed through him. And the most graceful conversation in the entire text appears in the final scene of that story. It's a private conversation just between Jesus and the man who had been blind. No curious disciples, no doubting neighbors, no avoiding parents. The Pharisees are still there, but they're over to the side with their arms crossed complaining to each other. And Jesus kind of swats them away with one statement. He turns to the man he has healed. And in the ultimate moment in the text, the only two people in the entire story who can truly see finally get to look each other in the eye. And they talk. But we're left to the side of the conversation as well. The text doesn't tell us what they talked about. I think because the text wants us to ask ourselves, where would we be? Would, be we, would we be one of the neighbors and think, this must be some kind of hoax? Would, be like, would we be like the parents who, uh, we hope it's true, but mostly be concerned about our own reputation? Or would we be like the Pharisees who seem to think that they know how God works better than God does? Would we be like Jesus, always ready to see past the trivial issues and straight to human need? Or would we be like the blind man, aware of our own brokenness enough to know that we're blind? This isn't the last time in John that Jesus faces the darkness John says that in the garden when Jesus was arrested, it was dark. But it wasn't just the darkness of the night. It was the darkness in the men's hearts who came carrying torches and lanterns into the garden to arrest Jesus. There's darkness and there's darkness. There was darkness in the heart of Judas, and he betrayed the servant who had earlier that night washed his feet. But more darkness, even in this world, just means there'll be more light. Father Thomas Merton said it well. Life is simple. We are living in a world that is absolutely transparent. And God is shining through it all the time. He says this is not just a fable or a nice story. It's true. If we abandon ourselves to God and forget ourselves... We see it sometimes, and we see it maybe frequently. God shows God's self everywhere, in everything, in people and things and nature and in events. It becomes very obvious that God is everywhere and in everything, and we cannot be without God. It's impossible. The only thing is that we don't see it. So the question is, is not... Not if God really gives sight to the blind. The question is, do we really see? Do we see that when we open the church and welcome a new family? Uh, do we see that when we stop and, and give someone who's homeless just a few dollars? Uh, do we see that just a sliver of the light come through in our eyes? When we pass this bread and the cup, do we see that we're passing the body of Christ from the darkness of our own hearts into the light of community? And do we see that sometimes there are people right next to us whose needs are so familiar to us that we don't even see their suffering? They were born blind, we say that's the way it is. But Jesus doesn't pass them by. He wants to heal the blindness in us all. Elizabeth Barrett Browning framed it this way, as a choice between seeing and not seeing. Earth is crammed with heaven, and every common bush is a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit around and pluck berries. Since the very beginning of time, light and darkness are being separated. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Let's pray together.
Mighty God, give us eyes that can see. Open our hearts that we can recognize you at work in our world. We thank you for your mercy. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Family, can we stand together? We're going to sing about God's amazing grace and how he's turned our stories around, how we were blind and now we can see. We invite you to join us. so glad that you decided to stay now for my sermon time. No, Rhett, really, you probably want to show some appreciation to Dr. Holland.
Just a couple of announcements. The first one is for you guys. Guys, are you listening up? Tuesday night is Men of God, Pulled Pork. The lesson is on how to love your wives and others. Okay, so it's going to be a great night. You, you, you can stop listening now. Gals, I need to talk to you for a moment. Tuesday night is Men of God. Get your boys here. Pulled Pork. We're going to be talking about how to love those that you are given to love. 6.30, Tuesday night. The other thing that I want to announce is that we're going to have a congregational meeting on March 17th, four weeks from today, after each service like we are in the habit of doing. However, we're not in the habit of getting together a congregational meeting in March, so you may be wondering what's going on. Well, over the next few weeks, we're going to be unveiling a plan that we've been working on for about the last three years. We've been working with an architect, working with other, other tradesmen, putting our ideas together. We want to repurpose some of the areas in the building that we have now to get more bathroom space, a better kitchen spot, adult classrooms, security for the children's department, and so forth. You'll see pictures and we'll, we'll be laying it out. But on the 17th, we need to, as a congregation, vote to move to, in that direction. So as I, like I said, just put it on your calendar to be here that day, March 17th. Between now and then, you'll be hearing a lot about what we're talking about and, and the cost and how we're going to pay for it and so forth. So just be aware of that. We're calling it Beyond Belief. The reason we're calling it that is for two reasons. One, I believe that God can do greater things than I can even think or imagine. Amen? And then secondly, there's a a lot of us here who truly believe that God is moving, doing amazing things right here at Wildwood. We believe in what he's doing, but the question is, what do we need to do beyond belief? How do we put it into action? So we're going to have a lot of conversations, a lot of input, a lot of things that is going to be pretty exciting. So like I said, March 17th, congregational meeting, and then we'll we'll be revealing it all together. Let's pray together. Almighty God, thank you for gathering us in in this space. Thank you more so for sending us out into the world and trusting us with with knowledge like the gospel and trusting us with the power of ministry in the Holy Spirit and trusting us to have our eyes opened to have our minds expanded, have our spirits ready and open to what you're going to do with us. Send us from this place with your love and blessing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Go in peace. We'll see you soon.